Hello, and welcome to today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information seven, seven, ah, today's Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center webinar. What the U.S. can learn from international efforts to improve pedestrian and bicycle safety. Today we'll be hearing from Hannah Meyer with the Federal Highway Administration, Libby Thomas with UNC Highway Safety Research Center, Connor Semler with Kittleton Associ and Associates, Dan Goodman with the Federal Highway, Highway Administration, and Gabe Rousseau also with the Federal Highway Administration. My name is James Gallagher, and I am the PBSC Communications Manager, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Good afternoon, Hannah and Libby and Connor and Dan and Gabe. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Kenny, if you can hear me and you can hear our speakers saying hello, uh, please click the hand icon in the upper right corner of your screen. This lets us know that your audio is working properly. Great, I'm seeing lots of hands. Uh, before we get started with the, the, today's webinar, I want to go over a few administrative details about the webinar software. Um, if for some reason your computer freezes, please reload the website and log back into the program. You will be able to rejoin, rejoin us mid-session. We will be posting presentation slides and recording the webinar to the PBIC website so you'll be able to look back at anything you might have missed. Please note that attendees will not be able to speak during the webinar. There are a lot of people in this call, and by muting your audio, it helps us to cut down on confusion and background noise. Still, you can ask questions or report issues through the question box in your webinar control panel. Please feel free to ask questions at any time. We will hold out a 20-minute Q&A session after our presentation. Within a couple of days, you will receive a follow-up email from the UNC Highway Safety Research Center that will include instructions for getting your CM credits. This webinar has been submitted to AICP and may be approved for one-and-a-half CM credits. So be on the lookout for that email. Most PBIC, most PBIC webinars are approved for CM credits, and you can learn more about PBIC webinars or check out past webinars at pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars. We also post frequent updates about our webinars and other, uh, other resources on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash pedbike, and you can join our mailing list at pedbikeinfo.org slash sign up. I promise I won't spam you. Now, before we start the feature presentation, I want to take two quick polls of the audience. First, let us know how many people are at your site watching this webinar. All right, thank you very much. And then tell us a little bit about your background. Okay, thank you very much. Now let's get to our presentation. Hannah, you want to take it from here? Sure. Thank you very much. So um, my name is Hannah Mayer. I'm with the Federal Highways Office of International Programs, and I'm the manager for the Global Benchmarking Program under which this um, effort was undertaken. And just to give you a little bit of an overview of the program, I can turn it to the next slide, please. So the Global Benchmarking Program is, is a new initiative that uh, Federal Highways recently started, and it focuses on identifying and adapting proven foreign innovations that can help Federal Highways respond to challenges facing the U.S. transportation system. The way this is done is by connecting our Federal Highway technical experts, either directly or indirectly, with uh, the innovations abroad and with the people that are involved in, in applying them. And uh, the way we see it is that there are a lot of other countries facing similar problems as we are in the United States, and it makes sense to see how they have tackled these problems and some of the solutions that they have, they have come up with, because we can learn a lot that way, and it can save our t time and money in doing that. And uh, this, is, uh, this program is distinguished from other federal highway uh, programs because it's more unilateral and it also involves a structured implementation approach. So we often have bilateral agreements with other countries, but they require negotiating topics and agreeing to certain things. But this program allows us to really target a specific area and go out and get information. And um, it's more of kind of a, a, a take versus a give and take. So it's, it's kind of a 
really good tool that we have. And it also important point is that it's not just information collection, but the point is to do something with the information that's collected to actually affect change in the U.S. and improve how we do things. So the ultimate goal of the program, we want to avoid duplic duplicative research, reduce overall costs, and accelerate improvements to our transportation system. Next slide, please. And uh, the way that we do this in terms of the methodology is that um, we have kind of a very strategic and flexible approach to this. And uh, it's kind of, we're trying to do the most with the limited resources that we have. And the key features include strategic selection of study topics. And um, this topic on uh, safe and connected pedestrian bicycle networks was a topic important to federal highways and DOT in general. And so we, so we uh, the leadership at Federal Highways approved that we pursue this topic. We also emphasize front-end information collection through what we call a desk study. And in fact, this uh, presentation is going to cover the findings from the desk study that was undertaken by the University of North Carolina. We also engage or use virtual exchange with other countries to collect information. And when necessary, we, we use foreign travel, but again, it's limited in nature and very tactical because we rely on that desk study to really pinpoint where those innovations are, where we should focus our efforts. Um, we also try to have effective and timely communication of findings like we are doing today with this uh, webinar. And um, again, we, the, the main focus is on implementation. And um, ultimately, we want to the program to help improve how we apply in, uh, transportation in the US and uh, help the uh, highway users and transportation users. So with that, I will hand it over back to the presenters. All right, now we will hear from uh, Libby Thomas. Thank you, Jane. So, um, yeah, as Hannah said, this was a desk uh, review, a kind of a pilot study, if you will, to identify as many potential innovations as we could find and then uh, review those and screen those that, and identify those that had promise for, for use in the United States. So with me presenting today is Connor Kimler from Kittleson and Associates. And now some, I want to introduce some other members of our project team from HSRC, Dan Jolene, Patty Harrison, Kate Hill, James Gallagher, Nathan Thurst, Laura Sant, me and Charlie Zagir. Uh, and from Kittleson, joining Connor was Paul Rias, who is living in Denmark, and that was a, an aid to our project, and Kevin Kreisig from with the University of Colorado at Boulder. On uh, the technical panel, I think Hannah is joined by Gabe and Dan today, and Christopher Dowell uh, also was uh, the manager on this project. So this is a brief, uh, just an overview of what we're going to talk about today. I'll just quickly talk about uh, the study and the study approach and our key findings, which are kind of aggregated into three general areas that we uh, are interrelated and all important for, uh, as Hannah indicated, for, for implementation of, of these innovations. So uh, the first part, I will discuss some of the design and operational types of features that we uncovered uh, in the countries we and cities that we reviewed. And then uh, we'll shift over to Connor, and he will discuss some of the prioritization practices and performance measurement. Um, as Hannah mentioned, uh, so there have been some prior um, global benchmarking studies. And uh, this builds on that. However, this was uh, focusing on the, the desk review as that initial uh, stage of gathering as much information as we could. 
And so that was the purpose here of this project was to identify noteworthy and innovative international designs, treatments, and practices that could be used uh, to help improve and complete uh, bicycle and pedestrian networks in the United States. So to accomplish that, we used a variety of techniques. Uh, we searched the literature, both academic and gray literature. We searched uh, international jurisdiction websites and research websites. Uh, we conducted an international survey of jurisdictions and their practitioners. And we reached out individually to some uh, practitioners and conducted some phone interviews. And so I want to highlight also what were the criteria for highlighted uh, practices in, in our report. But I'll come back to that in just a minute. So the general topics covered were uh, the general things we asked about, asked jurisdictions about, were how jurisdictions determine what is a complete and safe network, what kinds of performance measures are used, what methods they use to identify safety problems or gaps in their pedestrian and bicycle networks, what measures or criteria are used to prioritize improvements? And then finally, what innovative treatments have been used to address uh, safety problems or gaps? And we provided some guidance such as, you know, is this a new treatment or something that has never been implemented before, a certain time frame and things like that to help focus in on newer treatments that have been implemented since the prior study tours. Uh, so again, the criteria for inclusion were that they, the treatments or practices weren't identified in prior reports, uh, that they were innovative as far as we could determine, and the th three main criteria for selecting and highlighting treatments and ideas that might merit further study here in the U.S. are that they were consistent with one or more of FHWA's goals and objectives. They had uh, evidence of potential benefits or effectiveness or they had and or they had high potential use in the U.S. for improve, improving safety and connectivity for pedestrians or bicyclists. So the study findings were organized generally uh, the following categories around the infrastructure and that included um, designs and operations, uh, ITS types of treatments and policies in some cases, and then around prioritization practices and measures, performance measurement. Uh, we additionally had some evaluation uh, studies we identified and then um, the conclusions or key findings from, from this review. And so uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to address the uh, infrastructure practices and those the highlighted, uh, the practices I want to highlight today center mostly around bicycle network improvements. We found a lot more about bicycles. Um, and I meant to mention we reached out to over 100 jurisdictions in, I believe, 14 countries. We heard from 11, uh, and a lot of what we heard, we heard from about 25 jurisdictions on bicycle innovations and 11 on um, pedestrian innovations. So. Uh, we did hear a bit more about what countries and jurisdictions are doing with regard to bicycle network improvements. Um, so that's one, one of the focus areas I'm going to talk about. Uh, another area we heard about for pedestrian um, improvements was uh, really more limited auto traffic areas and pedestrian priority zones. And there were other things, traffic management techniques and operations that really helped to give more priority um, to pedestrians in certain areas. Um, and th these tended to fall under the um, heading of signalization, traffic control, and intelligent transportation types of systems. So one of the first um, treatments I would like to talk about is uh, priority bicycle streets. Uh, these we found to be similar to the bicycle boulevard concept from uh, a couple of decades ago. Now some cities are implementing similar um, treatments and they refer to as neighborhood greenways. Um, 
we found that, as in this country, there may be different design methods used to achieve these kinds of streets. But basically, what they are is that, uh, that often neighborhood or residential streets, sometimes business streets, uh, that were formerly auto-oriented are given bicycle priority. And this is done through a variety of design and uh, other practices. And the goal is that autos are allowed, but this is definitely a bicycle-focused street. And one of the characteristics of the streets as implemented in uh, a number of the European cities that we identified is that there are typically low auto traffic volumes and high uh, bicycle volumes. And so they are low-speed streets uh, with shared roadways, and cars are expected to, to travel at cycling speed. So it achieves a flow function for bicyclists. In other words, it may provide a connector, an important connector for bicyclists to actually travel from these residential areas to link up with other uh, facilities or destinations. Uh, but it provides access, just access to the destinations for cars. So those are the two main functions that need to be uh, managed on these kinds of streets, and the designs um, should be uh, supportive of those. Connor's going to talk a little bit more about an evaluation. Um, here's a couple of examples of different streets as implemented in different Netherlands cities. Um, some cities have tried one-lane designs, and others have used two lanes. So um, the one-lane design tends to require motorists to negotiate the space as they're uh, overtaking or meeting other vehicles or bikes. So um, uh, that tended to seem to work up somewhat better. Uh, in, in, in this study, uh, I mentioned Rick Delbracine there. Um, so Connor will talk a little bit more about those later. Another well, call it a, a treatment, and this is kind of a planning concept, the idea of bicycle superhighways. Um, the idea is that uh, it really uh, separated facilities are really desired, uh, but it may link together different facility types uh, to create a long linear route connecting uh, one location to another. So the idea is that it really is intended to support longer trips. Uh, and you see there, um, three miles or higher, with fewer stops. So it minimizes delay and inconvenience and conflicts, and um, therefore would improve safety and mobility for bicyclists. So again, it's often a space to themselves, often within the road right of way, but separated facilities are sometimes even in other, uh, like path rights of way are used in some jurisdictions. Over underpasses might be used to bypass junctions, and if those can't be built, then Oftentimes, uh, there's an effort to give bicyclists priority at signalized intersections and so forth to, to just improve their um, mobility. So this is an example. Those images there from uh, Copenhagen, a long bridge that was used to bypass this barrier and also a heavy pedestrian area uh, down below there that to reduce the conflicts and so forth so the bicyclists could uh, cycle quickly through this area. A couple of other designs, so those are, um, include uh, lane lighting or path lighting, and um, those are typically motion sensitive, sensitive and solar powered. Um, they've been applied also in a jurisdiction in Australia that we learned about to provide uh, nighttime lighting for path cycling. And we felt this had promise for use in the U.S. since many crashes um, involving cyclists may occur after dark or they're caught out uh, or the, the, the network just isn't uh, safe for them at night. So maybe sometimes there are some alternate path routes that if provided the right type of uh, lighting and security or has sufficient volumes, it may serve as an alternate route for cyclists at night. Um, that's an example of the starry night uh, path. I'm sure you've probably all seen images of it from Eindhoven uh, in the Netherlands. Um, so they are also uh, try to be environmentally sensitive and uh, by being both solar powered and often motion sensitive so that they light up as a person. I don't think the starry night path does that, but they may light up as, um, you know, they detect motion and come on and then they dim again as, as uh, people move away. 
So that minimizes environmental impacts. Um, another design or um, kind of traffic control type device is similar, I guess, to a bike box, except that uh, this is a setback motorist stop bar. There's a, a, I guess it requires less paint in a way. You see the bike stop bar up ahead there next to the, the pedestrian crossing. So that gets the bicyclists out in front of motor vehicles and uh, help allows them, if they're making this right turn, to go ahead and make that and be more conspicuous to the cars um, there. If you're really ambitious, uh, those of you and jurisdictions that have tons of cyclists and lots of cars, <laughs> And this is kind of a, I'll just go quickly through this, but this is a grade separated path roundabout. So the auto traffic is uh, moved, changes elevation to this elevated roundabout traffic circle. The bikes do not have to change uh, grade, and their roundabout is here. And this, uh, this design was used to replace a series of T intersections, so it was a complex traffic situation. So such a design might be used in similar complex situations in the right context in the U.S., but um, this is a rather ambitious undertaking, uh, no doubt. Another uh, design that we learned about in the academic literature, the research literature, was a, a cyclist roundabout, and this is very different from the one we just looked at. So this is for multi-lane roundabouts. It's being tried in Auckland, New Zealand, and the design approach is to narrow the two lanes on the approach to the roundabout. As you see here, they've added uh, this median, they narrow the lanes, the travel lanes down, really forcing the motorized traffic to slow down on the approaches to a level that's comfortable for bikes. Uh, it, they are narrow enough that larger vehicles uh, need to take uh, kind of the middle and aren't accommodated in the one lane. Uh, so this is undergoing some trials, and I think Connor will talk a little bit about some data from that, from that study. So some of the traffic management and operations type measures we learned about were green waves. And this uh, uses a progressive signal timing at bicycle speed. So all the traffic is uh, going at about, I think in the examples, are around 18 kilometers per hour. Um, the green LED lane lights can be used in conjunction with a progressive uh, signal coordination. I should have mentioned that is coordination of signals along a corridor. So subsequent signals are timed. Uh, to reduce stopping by bicycles. And then the green LED lane lights are something that bicycles ride over on the approaches, and if they are lit up, then they know that if they're uh, riding at speed, at certain speed, they have sufficient time to clear the intersection. Some other ideas are giving bicyclists more mobility, uh, such as through designs and operations that allow a free right turn or a right turn bypass or bicycle stop exemption at the top of T intersections uh, for a through movement. So these treatments basically allow bicyclists to continue movements when adjacent traffic has a red signal when that movement does not conflict with the motor vehicles. And um, it may conflict with pedestrians. But I'll show you an example of the free right turn bypass in a couple of slides. But right now I'm going to show you a little bit more about a green wave example from Stockholm, which developed a nine. So this basically takes a regular um, roadway corridor and turns it into uh, basically a nine kilometer long green wave. So it allows bicyclists to ride in one direction. As you see there, they can ride the whole distance without putting their foot down for a stoplight if they uh, ride at, the, at that speed. And, and this corridor is a heavily used cycling corridor. So this is a place where there are lots of bicyclists, lots of demand. Uh, this was a signature project for this, uh, for this specific city. They did remove a lane of auto traffic to provide wide, wider bike lanes and more pedestrian space. Uh, so this is a free right turn. I hope you can uh, see this a little bit. But so what this basically uh, describes is the bike approach is over here. 
there are separate signals and so forth for bicyclists. When the auto traffic has a red, if bikes are turning right, they're allowed to continue this maneuver on around as long as they're not conflicting. It's up to them to yield to pedestrians who may be stopped for the, the red light for the, or may be crossing here for the, when the cars are stopped. Uh, when they're traveling in the same through with the motor vehicles, then it shifts the bikes over so that they're in the same general vicinity with the uh, crosswalks. The motorists are kind of looking out for bikes and pedestrians in the same general area before they might make any, any turns. Uh, traffic. Okay, a little more about traffic management. Uh, so I mentioned some of the things that are being done for pedestrians are uh, to give, for example, give them feedback on estimated waiting time signals. Uh, another thing is to give more green time for pedestrians at single control junctions. I know some U.S. jurisdictions are doing that uh, more often as well. So uh, while this might be somewhat innovative, it's probably being tried by some of some peer jurisdictions here already. Something that has not been used as much in the U.S. Um, in contrast to U.S. streets where usually auto modes are the dominant mode, even, even in our urban cores oftentimes, uh, some of the cities in Europe, and, and a lot of this is based on historical legacy and just the fact that you know, there isn't much space and they also want to reduce congestion and uh, provide a better environment for, and more livability for uh, people in, that live in urban cores and, and more access to businesses and so forth. So limited vehicular traffic areas are being expanded or changed or altered and tried in more kinds of locations. Um, and these are some of the example locations. These uh, cities in Italy are, have variants in size of the uh, limited auto traffic areas and, and the restrictions such as whether only residents are allowed to drive in or maybe taxis that have hotel destinations or freight. Uh, again, they're expected to drive at very low speeds. These are considered pedestrian areas with some limited uh, shared use allowed in most cases. Um, some other uh, examples have been tried in Toronto, Ontario, near university areas, expanding uh, traffic restricted areas. And in Tokyo, Japan, they've tried some uh, restrictions based on certain times of day where pedestrians have priority. So I believe now we need to turn over to Connor to talk about some of the policies and um, decision making that, that help get these kinds of innovations in place. Great. Thanks, Libby. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the right screen is showing, so we'll let me know if it's not. Um, but yeah, so that was a great overview, and um, Libby got to start a lot of the really cool things we found through our work. Um, and we're going to shift now into more of the policy side and the, um, the important behind the scenes work that needs to happen in order for a jurisdiction to advance the innovative ideas that we saw. saw. So less cool photos, but important content coming up. <laughs> um, so we, we really tried to understand in this project what, um, you know, what's driving the these certain cities and countries to be leaders in, in um, walking and biking, and um, found some consistent themes across the, um, the the jurisdictions we interviewed. Um, for for one, um, their designs are governed by policies that are aimed at um, a specific goal, and that goal is shifting priority from auto to bicycles and pedestrians. Um, the policies are deliberate and explicit, and um, they they don't um, they don't use language like we need to treat all users of the road equally. They use language like we need more people walking and biking, <laughs> um, and then they identify tangible steps to help um, 
realize the goals that are set out. So if there's a mode, sh mode split goal, um, how are we going to get there? Um, so the, the organization of this section of the presentation is to talk, to talk about several of um, the areas where policies are important. So, <clears throat> um, we're we're going to talk about prioritization and um, performance measurement and evaluation. Um, so one example of, of an important um, shift, which was a political challenge, comes from Alberta, where um, the highway agency is proposing to change a policy to add flexibility for where uh, off-street trails can be built. Um, they ran into trouble where they couldn't bridge certain connections, and um, the the best option, although the best remaining option, although not ideal, is to build within the highway right-of-way. Uh, the proposed action would allow for that and would help um, create build connectivity between trails and facilitate, facilitate movements across barriers, such as where the highway is the highway bridge is the only thing across the river, or where the highway itself is the barrier. Adding that flexibility will allow the province to um, meet the demand and make those connections that they previously hadn't been able to. For project prioritization, um, pro project funding usually has to project funding has to be prioritized and, and selected uh, to be spent on certain projects. And the jurisdictions we spoke with um, were really conscious of what priorities matter to improve conditions for walking and biking. Um, the planners and engineers in these communities are riding bikes and walking um, in their streets on a regular basis both in how they live their life, but also when they are going to meetings or when they are doing site visits, they're doing them on bicycle or on foot where, where it's appropriate. Um, and as, as one example, Copenhagen had uh, has a set of prioritization criteria for funding <laughs> that uh, looks familiar to things that we, we know but uh, are a little bit more advanced. For example, if they have a street with over 5,000 daily bikes, um, which is eye-opening number, uh, that those streets should have a separated bike facility. Um, they also look at things like the crashes like we would um, comfort for the bicyclist or pedestrian, which is sort of an emerging um, practice in the U.S. is something that a lot of countries we looked at are including, and um, Copenhagen is no different. They also look for projects that can help bridge connections in the bike network. Uh, um, and related to that, contraflow travel, where, you, where bikes, um, recognizing that cyclists are more sensitive to out-of-direction travel than people in a car, um, it, looking for opportunities to provide that contraflow travel. And um, trying to tie new projects in with one, ongoing or recently completed projects to um, leverage that momentum and um, keep things up to date. Another example comes from Fredericia in Denmark. Um, they had traditionally been prioritizing projects based on locations where they had the most crashes, um, but they decided to transform or evolve their um, methods to look at, um, especially look at school traffic. So. Um, what are the primary routes that students are using to get to and from school and, and then focus on reducing traffic along those routes, providing safer crossings, you know, including refuges, uh, pedestrian refuge islands and bike lanes, um, and, and improving the conditions that were already there. Uh, in addition, the agency places more weight on improving routes to school um, as there is often more traffic less daylight and less time to clear snow in the morning. It's, it's a more sensitive um, trip than, than other types of trips. <clears throat> Several countries we looked at have um, national prioritization efforts. Uh, a couple examples on the screen here. Um, Finland has developed national guidelines for conducting cost-benefit analysis. So um, the the Government doesn't require that doesn't require that the methods are followed, but they 
um, recommend them and offer a good tool for local municipalities to conduct this analysis. Um, and it actually has detailed guidance on the socioeconomic impacts of transportation investment, which is really innovative and um, recognizes something that we all know, that transportation impacts impacts our um, communities in, a, in many ways, um, but we don't often enough have the right tools to understand those impacts. Um, Japan has um, <laughs> made very serious commitment to reducing crashes. Um, they want to become the safest uh, transportation country in the world uh, and looking for a very, very low rate of crashes per, per um, traveler. Um, and then th that commitment translates into prioritization. So um, the safety benefits are weighted more heavily than our delay and capacity consideration uh, in a meaningful way. Um, and then Sweden has, uses a um, land use model that predicts demand for walking and biking, um, and it's very flexible and re responsive to changes in land use and can be used in even very small geographies, um, which has been really helpful for local muni municipalities there. The next topic is performance measurement, and it's um, something that I think the whole our whole industry is advancing and, and evolving uh, as we recognize that um, the old adage says, what gets measured gets done. Um, these lots of, lots of countries that have seen these really uh, um, positive outcomes for walking and biking um, are, are measuring things to support those decisions. Um, and, and they're not just looking at traditional or um, conventional transportation goals, but thinking about the broader impact of Copenhagen of a list of performance measures that they're tracking in their annual bicycle account. Um, things. This is again sort of similar to things we're familiar with, with seeing, but again uh, a little bit different. So, um, Libby showed you an example of the superhighway network. Well, more, they're actually tracking bicycle speeds along those corridors, recognizing that certain cyclists are looking for that faster experience and, and want to know how well they provide, they're accommodating it. <laughs> they're looking at bicycle trips per year and they reference millions of bicycle trips per year, um, segregated out by geography and uh, trip type. Commute modes, but of course, by bicycling kilometers per day and per capita. Um, and then some of the more interesting impacts. So uh, it, they want to know if they're reducing the number of sick days, which is a commonly cited benefit of active transportation, uh, active commuting especially. Uh, so they're tracking how sick days change per year. Likewise, are they reducing vehicle um, vehicle kilometers traveled? And then, um, what's the average bicycle trip length, and how is how are the how's this impacting carbon dioxide emissions? <clears throat> In Amsterdam, they assess pedestrian accessibility for every address in the city. Um, and again, using land use and density to predict what those pedestrian volumes are. And that's a really interesting, it's, it's a really interesting tool because they can see the impacts. Um, they have a database of, these, of this accessibility and they can see the impacts of decisions um, on uh, in, impacts of infrastructure decisions on access for households, residents, and, and, and workers. In Sertelenbos, um, the Netherlands, they have are identified design standards for their bicycle network. So we're not talking, they're not, not just talking about um, street design, intersection design, but the actual network design, which is pretty interesting. Um, and they identify root level, root level quality. So some examples of things in, that fall into that category are 
a ratio of actual travel time, I'm sorry, actual travel distance to the straight line distance, and they want that to be within 1.15 and one and a quarter, um, that ratio. Intersections per kilometer without bicycle priority, they, the maximum they have is, is 1.5. On their primary network, 1.5, and on their secondary network is two. So no more than two intersections per kilometer that don't have bicyclist priority. Um, another factor is the number of turns per kilometer along a route, trying to minimize that. And um, they also identify wait time at traffic signals with a maximum of 40 seconds along their primary network, um, which is pretty impressive. Um, street level facility design is more familiar to the types of things we're used to seeing. Um, separated bike lane, two-way, one-way and two-way, pavement color, speed humps, traffic calming. And then intersection level uh, tries to blend the desired traffic control based on what the um, auto network type with things, you know, the functional classification for autos and whether it's crossing a primary or secondary bicycle network type. Another often cited example um, is Landemats from Sweden. Um, it's a two, 2006 update of the city's first uh, traffic strategy plan, which was adopted back in 1999. Landemats stands for Environmentally Adaptable Transport Systems. And the plan is based on the idea that it is possible to combine growth with ambitious environmental goals. One of its overall goals is to reduce motor vehicle traffic in favor of alternative modes of travel. Um, and the plan recognizes this goal as also being a means of achieving other plan goals, like improving quality of life and health and attracting people and companies to the city. It has seven focus areas, including two, two of them are pedestrian traffic and bicycle traffic. And it sets these firm benchmarks. You can see these, um, these dates are a bit out of date now. but um, trying to increase, increase the number of safe crossings to 100% by 2030 is um, the sort of thing that they're measuring progress against. And um, to, when, you, when you have something firm like this written down and, and decision makers and politicians can point to it, it, it really motivates um, staff to advance projects that achieve these goals. Um, a few others listed on the screen, I won't walk through all of them. And then uh, um, there are some Good examples of national performance measures. Uh, Norway has a national walking strategy that identifies um, performance measures related to um, meeting its national goals. Um, so percent of, the percent of people making a walking only trip each day and the percent of all trips that are walk only by, by demographic groups, average kilometers walked per day, and uh, the percent of all trips that are under two kilometers um, that are made by walking. Finland uh, recognizes that a key aspect of cyclist comfort and safety is the surface evenness, the pavement condition. And um, since no innovative technology scan would be complete without a reference to lasers, I made sure to include this, that the, um, they actually are driving around a small car with laser sensors and a GPS, GPS and a camera to um, measure the, the surface quality of their cycle path. Uh, responses from some of the jurisdictions indicated that they have monitored or measured the safety and operational impacts of their recent projects for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, evaluation is the second, you know, the second half of what we do, and it's how we learn how well things are working. Um, officials from the Netherlands provide information, and um, that gets that gets fed into that country's summary of. Um, how, how, how things are progressing from a um, walking and biking standpoint. In 2012, the Netherlands found that um, actually crash, um, crash rates are rising, particularly among, in, among the, um, the subgroups of serious injury and single bicycle crashes. The single bicycle crashes was especially um, surprising to them, and so they, they dug into the data a little bit more. And um, 
they suspect the causes of the, that climb in rates is um, just more people bicycling, but an aging population, which is also bicycling more. Uh, and so in response, they're looking at designing trails and, and paths to be more um, forgiving in the same way that we once were designing <laughs> our streets for cars. So the, um, let me tee up a few of the next couple slides for me, which was um, which is nice. So all these countries are evaluating how well these new ideas are working, and, and we can see we can use that information to help understand how well it might work for us here. Um, so the bicycle superhighway in Copenhagen, um, the evaluation of the first route found significant growth in bicycle volume, um, and 10% of the new users of the, of the superhighway had shifted mode. Um, the others came from different routes they had previously traveled. They found that travel times really weren't changed, so that's something they're continuing to look at since that was one of the goals of the project. Um, there's still a relatively high number of stops for traffic signals and um, bottlenecks that haven't yet been addressed. Um, but the project, they also found through their evaluation that the project had helped the municipalities along the route. There are five municipalities that the superhighway travels through. Um, it actually helped those communities work together better and create relationships that didn't previously exist. Um, and the, the point there is to highlight that evaluation should be comprehensive and, and the impacts of these projects are not limited to um, one or two transportation specific measures. The priority bicycle streets um, from in the Netherlands that Libby talked about, which are sort of a second wave of bicycle boulevards, um, found that the um, well, found that the designs were inconclusive, and that's mostly because I'm sorry, the the outcomes were inconclusive, and that's mostly because the design of the facilities was not consistent. So it was hard to draw conclusions that crossed all of the facilities. Um, some of the challenges they identify, though, is there's still um, parking, people parking in the streets and blocking the, the paths, both commercial vehicles and private vehicles. Um, the streets in residential-only neighborhoods, though, appeared to have fewer conflicts than those with commercials, which is not that surprising. The cyclist roundabout in Auckland, um, the, a pretty detailed study of those um, those facilities found there were significant reductions in um, the speeds of cars entering, exiting, and circulating the roundabout, um, which is one of the goals. But at this point, it was too, there were there were not conclusive crash findings. Um, the construction costs, however, were estimated to be 25% less than standard than for a standard multi-lane roundabout and that there weren't impacts on capacity, although that's qualified by saying these are relatively low volume uh, roundabouts. Um, some of those Danish intersection controls that Libby talked about um, did have, on the other hand, pretty conclusive findings. I've listed here the, the different types of treatments that they applied. There were four. Um, methods that were attempted at different intersections, and they found no significant difference in the rate of conflict between any of these treatments and the comparable untreated intersections. Uh, at the four inter control intersections where right-turning bicyclists are not permitted to turn right on red, approximately half of them did anyway, yet accident statistics and hospital records um, indicate that there's a low incidence of bicycle pedestrian crashes. Um, so this was a, a pretty strong success Um, and then just zooming out from a bit of from a macro level perspective, um, the did did some some agencies and some projects tried to evaluate whether um, the projects had an impact on people's travel behavior. Um, the quiet lanes in the UK um, didn't really see any significant mode split, although there was slightly more impact on walking than bicycling. Um, but nonetheless, the community strongly supports them and wants to expand the program. And then in Spain, there, um, 
they have 106 kilometers of greenways and car-free trails that link the Pyrenees and Mediterranean through multiple communities, um, known as the Girona Greenway Consortium. And um, it, they did find a significant impact on residential travel behavior. People who lived local, local to the trail were bicycling and walking more, um, but there was not such an impact on, on tourists. And um, the other finding was that most of the new use of the trail was recreational. So some of our key takeaways um, from the project, bicycling and walking are high priorities and, and the goals in these communities reflect that. There's, there's an explicit, as I said before, an explicit and deliberate approach to um, di designing and building the transportation infrastructure for walking and biking. Um, and that comes from the, the top down. Um, the, a lot of these communities and jurisdictions have significant local autonomy in decision making, so they're not um, subject to the um, design controls of a, of a larger, larger um, geographic area. Um, people, community involvement is another is you know, not surprisingly a strong component of this work. Um, and the 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 actual people on the ground in doing the planning and design um, are enthusiastic and interested in trying new things and learning from their experience and um, you know sort of embody that um, mindset that we can um, try new things and try and continue to always improve. So um, with that, I'm going to give it back to James, and we can hopefully hear a little bit about um, the FHWA's takeaways from this project. All right, thank you, Connor and Libby. And now we'll hear from uh, Dan Goodman and Gabe Rousseau uh, before getting to our Q&A. And if you have any questions, please go ahead and enter them in the question box. Okay, so thank you so much. This is Dan Goodman. Um, I'm in the Office of Human Environment at the Federal Highway Administration. Um, I really appreciate all the uh, presentations before. Um, what I'll talk about is sort of what we've done um, since we completed the, the desktop study. Um, so we, we found the desktop study to be um, really helpful just to understand um, what other countries around the world are doing um, in the pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure space. Um, especially because, because we really are focusing on connected pedestrian and bicycle networks at FHWA um, and really looking to, to move that ball forward um, in the U.S. over the next couple of years. Um, so, so one of the main things that we did as follow-up to the desktop study um, is that Gabe Rousseau and I um, traveled to the Netherlands um, in August of 2015 um, and spent a week uh, basically meeting with uh, local practitioners, regional practitioners, and also folks from the national government. Um, and we really spent a lot of time um, really picking their brains about um, how they had gotten to the point that they're at now. Um, so we spent a lot of time talking about design guidelines, um, also, also just sort of general conceptual and theoretical approaches to the work that they're doing. Um, and really we, we focused on um, how they got from point A to point B, um, recognizing that 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 in the U.S. we want to move in that direction, but that it's going to take it's going to take a little bit of time. So we we spent a lot of time talking about um, the steps that they went through to get to the point that they're at today. Um, so we met with uh, practitioners primarily on the trip. Um, we also met with advocates and consultants, um, and we did quite a bit of technical field work um, in the communities that we visited. Um, so we went to to Utrecht, um, Deventer, Arnhem, The Hague, Delft, and Amsterdam. Um, and the thing that, that I wanted to uh, give people a heads up on is, is encourage you to keep your eye out for the report um, that is on the screen right now. Um, it's a bicycle network planning facility design approaches in the Netherlands and the United States. Um, this is a, a report that we've worked on through FHWA's Global Benchmarking Program. Um, and it, it basically captures our lessons learned um, as a result of that full week of experience in, in August 2015. Um, we expect that the report will be coming out very soon, hopefully next month, um, and we'll be sending out announcements to APBP and to the 
um, to the state DOT pedestrian and bicycle coordinators um, once it comes out. Um, just to, to sort of give you a little heads up on, on things that we'll be talking about in the document, um, we identified uh, four primary lessons learned um, through all of our experience there. Um, the first one is, is prioritizing seamless and efficient bicycle movement. That's one of the things that, that we really recognized when we were there, um, how efficient it is to bicycle for transportation um, in the Netherlands. And a lot of that comes back to, to how they've built out their, their um, connected bicycle networks. And so we'll be talking in the report a lot about um, specific examples um, of ways that they've really prioritized the efficiency of movement um, for biking. The second one is, is trusting in users and in the adaptability of the transportation system. So one of the things that, that we saw that really um, helped to create a very efficient transportation system is that um, the different users, whether they're drivers or bikers or walkers, um, you know, there, there's a, a, a fair amount of trust that is placed in them and that, that allows for some different design choices. And we thought that that was uh, notable and, and worth considering in the US. The third one is, is really focusing on designing for behavior that you want to see. And so we, we spend uh, a little bit of time in the report um, sort of drawing a distinction between the design approaches in the Netherlands and the US, um, really focusing on, on what we saw in the Netherlands as being kind of beneficial and resulting in good outcomes which is really what we want to focus on, um, but really looking at, you know, how do, how do we want the, the different modes to interact um, and how do we design so that we see that interaction um, as opposed to, uh, for example, thinking about the worst case scenario um, and then designing backwards from that, which is what we sometimes do um, in the U.S. Um, the last one is prioritizing network connectivity. So this is something that really focuses and aligns with what FHWA is focusing on now and, and, and it's what we intend to be really, really drilling down on in the coming year um, and something that, you know, it's in the Netherlands and, and all the different cities that, that um, we visited, their networks were really built out, they were really connected um, and it made biking a viable transportation choice for everyone and that's something that um, we're looking to do here in the country. Um, so this is a report, again, that will be coming out um, hopefully next month, um, and Gabe is going to talk through another next step um, coming out of our, our experience on the Global Benchmarking uh, Study. All right. Thanks, Dan. So this is Gabe Rousseau. I'm in the Office of Safety in, at the Federal Highway Administration, and um, Dan's covered nicely you know, the report that, that we uh, hope to have coming out very soon. Um, one of the key goals of the Global Benchmarking Program, um, I think it's fair to say, is, is outreach and, and sharing the information that our colleagues overseas are um, uh, you know, developing on innovative practices that, that we can then apply in the U.S. So the report that, that Dan and I have, have worked on and will come out soon is one way to do that. Um, you know, the, the information that Libby and Connor presented today is another way we're trying to do that. And then we, we're working on a series of short-term and long-term activities at Federal Highway Administration to, to continue fostering the, uh, you know, the adoption of practices that, that world experts, such as the Dutch, have related to building bike, uh, safe and comfortable bike networks. So one of the things we're going to be doing here in the Washington, D.C. area in a little over a, or around a month, actually, is to work with uh, our Dutch uh, counterparts to have what they call a Think Bike Workshop. And that will be focusing on infrastructure here in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and we'll be bringing a team of Dutch experts over to, to work with uh, D.C. officials and, and um, you know, others in the, in the greater D.C. area to improve a particular area of the city for, for biking uh, and improve network connections. Um, we'll also be in, including several members of, of the United States Department of Transportation's Mayor's Challenge Cities. So as you may know, hopefully you're familiar with this, but uh, Secretary Fox, our U.S. Department of Transportation Secretary, um, uh, about a year ago launched a, a, a kickoff event for a Mayor's Challenge, which now has over uh, 240 cities that are enlisted uh, to try to make improvements to their walking and biking infrastructure to make walking bike and biking safer and more convenient. So we'll have a handful of cities from the Mayor's Challenge communities coming to, to participate in that Think Bike workshop and hopefully bring back what what they're seeing here in D.C. Uh, to their communities as well. 
Um, so with that, I'm going to kick it back to Dan, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the longer-term types of topics that we're looking at. Okay, great. Thanks, Gabe. Um, so, so as I mentioned, we, we did the desktop study. Um, then we, we did the, the field, the technical field work in the Netherlands. Um, and now we're planning the Think Bike Workshop. Moving forward from the Think Bike Workshop, the way that we're really going to document and track what we intend to do um, over the next um, year as a result of our experience um, working with the, with the Dutch, um, it's going to be captured in FHWA Strategic Agenda for Pedestrian and Bicycle Transportation. This is a, a project that is underway right now. Um, we, we anticipate completing the project um, this summer. And it's really going to lay out what FHWA is going to be focusing on for the next three to five years. It's going to be a very action-oriented document um, that really lists out um, what our priorities are and what, what we intend to be focusing on. Um, so it'll be talking about connected networks, improving safety. There's going to be a big emphasis on equity um, and also an emphasis on encouraging more people to walk and bike for transportation. Um, Within that, encouraging more people, there's going to be a big emphasis also on data, and specifically volume data. We've got quite a bit of work underway at FHWA focusing in that space, um, and we think it's an area where we're going to uh, big, make big advances over the next couple of years. Um, but the strategic agenda is where we're going to also lay out um, specific things that we're going to focus on um, resulting from our international desktop scan and, and our work um, in the Netherlands. A few examples of that are um, in the area of bike parking. Um, one of the things that we were really impressed by is that nearly every community we went to um, had very high quality um, bike parking at, at their transit facilities, for example. Um, it was very high quality, it was very comfortable, um, and the capacity was, was really um, impressive. And so. That's an area where in the U.S. I think that we could probably learn from that and build on that, and so we'll, we'll probably, see, probably be focusing on that um, in the coming year. Um, also, just generally in the strategic agenda, we'll be laying out our research priorities um, and some of the areas where we intend to be focusing on. And I think um, a lot of the things that we talked about and that will be, that will be discussed in the, the report that comes out next month um, will sort of lead to some, some logical research next steps that, that we'll be laying out in the strategic agenda. Um, so with that, I'll pass it back, um, and we look forward to um, answering any questions that folks might have. All right, thank you, Dan and Gabe. Um, now it's time for questions. Uh, I've got a handful of questions so far, but if you have, if you have a question, you let's submit it, go ahead and type it in now. Um, but the first question I have is, um, do you know how many countries have audible pedestrian signals at all intersections? This is Libby. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I don't know how many have audible pedestrian signals, but I think one of the countries that has done a lot of work in that area is Japan. And um, so that uh, there's a bit of a mention to that, and there might be some references to some additional resources there. It's, but they are using a, a lot of new technologies on their APS, and, and they sound pretty user-friendly. So I, I'll have to go back to the report. We didn't bring that in. I'll see if I can find it while we're uh, taking other questions. Uh, this is Connor. I don't have an answer to that question either, but it does r remind me to talk about one other cool thing that we found. In, um, there are some um, countries, I think it's most, mostly the um, Northern Europe, they're doing, um, using rain sensors to modify the wait time for pedestrians and bicyclists so that they have, uh, at, at signals, they have less time they're required to wait for a, you know, a walk or a green, um, which is a, not the same as the question, but it's still a pretty neat idea. <laughs> some additional information about these systems um, in Japan. They're, they use audible overhead, uh, I'm sorry, they use receiver-based systems. So the user would be equipped with, um, a visually impaired person would have a, uh, a receiver and then the APS devices talk directly to those. And the te early testing seemed to, to be pretty promising. 
I can't recall if there was something similar for, um, but yeah, that's the main that's the main thing. All right. Uh, the next question is: Could you talk a little more about some successful strategies you've seen for enabling public discussion, not just input on incorporating bicycle pedestrian transportation? So um, we, it, it's a little bit difficult. We did talk, ask for information about how people gathered input, and it's a little bit difficult to determine exactly what's going on through a desk review, and, and maybe um, Dan and Gabe have more insights. But one thing we did learn is that there's, there's a more active outreach in some jurisdictions, um, as uh, I think Connor mentioned, there's so much more cycling and um, transportation by, you know, walking and biking in many of these countries that there's, I think, more of a common understanding of meeting the needs of all types of walkers and bicyclists. So that's one factor I think that's very different from here in the U.S. oftentimes. And then the other is that is this active type of outreach where, you know, staff will actually cycle out to community meetings and you know, and that's the opportunity that they have to discuss issues in depth, I think. So uh, other other jurisdictions use surveys to get input from people about uh, if things are working, how well they're working, where the needs are, and things like that. So there just seems to be real active outreach as well as a more, um, there's more of a common vision, I'll say, which might be, um, you know, we're building towards in the U.S., but there's more of a common vision of equity and that everyone should deserve access throughout many of these, these jurisdictions. All right, great. Thank you. Um, the next question I got is, how did you address language barriers when reaching out to these other countries and in interpreting the information they provided? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so, yeah, fortunately, the, a lot of a lot of people speak English, and a lot of the work is done in English. It's it's amazing. A lot of these these reports are published in English um, when they you know, when they do work. Um, so that's been very helpful for us. Um, Paul Rias has become um, he, on, on our research team. He's become fluent in Danish, having married a Danish woman and, and moved there. So they helped us in one one of the countries where there was a lot of great information to pull from. Um, other than that, we had to rely on the very good English speaking skills, English speaking and writing skills of um, our partners overseas. All right, thank you. Um, when talking about priority bicycle streets, when you say low auto traffic volumes, what what does low mean? Yeah, that's a good question. That's probably a fairly subjective determination, but I think basically on all of these, on the goal for those types of streets is that it provides access to people who live along them or have business businesses along them, but they are not really used for through uh, functions for auto auto traffic. So it's it's basically the in and the out trip uh, for the people who live along those segments. And, and the, the access is, is controlled, so, uh, and then in favor of bicycles. So it kind of fits the uh, bicycle boulevard model, as, as we mentioned earlier. Um, one thing that, we, that uh, practitioners did indicate is that they seem to work best if there are more bicycles than, than cars using the streets. All right. Uh, thank you very much. The next question I got is, did you try to find more international examples from non-Western countries, uh, such as those from a more from Asia or South America, uh, places where transportation systems are more fluid but have proven mode shares? Mm -hmm. So our outreach focus on European countries that we knew, knew to also be doing a lot in terms of pedestrian and bicycle networks that are advanced in these areas. 
and additionally we reached out to Australian jurisdictions and Canada and, and Japan. Um, in particular, we thought uh, Australia and Canada may be more like the U.S. in terms of uh, where they are on, on the continuum of implementing uh, new types of planning and other innovative strategies. But we know. So there may be. You can uh, talk to Gabe and Dan and see if they want a, another study on uh, to reach out to some <laughs> additional countries. Yeah, yeah, just to add on to that, um, we were, because we're really focusing on the infrastructure side, um, we were wanting this desktop study um, to focus more on that, you know, countries that have um, well-established, connected pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure. Um, we were less focused on the mode share side, but we we certainly think that's an important part of the story, and we're we're opening we're open to looking at that topic more if there's interest. All right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the next question I have is with respect to transit facilities. How are you looking at pedestrian and bicycle facilities, not just bike parking, but location of bike lanes, et cetera, and how are you benchmarking that? Um, so we, this is, this is, I assume that when they say you, they're referring to the countries we looked at. Um, and, and they, a lot of land use played a key consideration in, in all of the planning that we reviewed. And um, a big attractor like a transit center um, would, you know, reveal itself in the network planning activities. So um, I think that was one of the things that I... I'm oh, sorry, could you I, repeat yourself, Connor? You're cutting in and out there, uh, your audio. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I, I apologize for that. I was saying one of the things that I observed is that the network planning activities really um, leverage the information they get from, from land use like origin, um, like origin destinations, and that transit centers would represent a really important destination um, and origin. So um, the planning there is really, you know, they take they take a high level view and figure out where the demand is going to be, and then develop routes, um, you know, a network that serves those trips. So people from their home to their neighborhood transit center, transit station, and also from the central transit station to to jobs. Um, those are prioritized in developing a cycle, cycling and walking network. All right, thank you. And a reminder, we've only got a few more questions uh, submitted left, so if you still have a question out there, please go ahead and submit it. Because um, once we run out of questions, we'll be ending the webinar. Uh, so my next question is, during the international consultations, were planners and traffic engineers consulting with health, health units or public health spokespersons? Generally, we targeted the transportation agencies in these jurisdictions, so they may have had discussions with, you know, I think the input came from a, a variety of sources. We didn't restrict you know, where the input came from, but I don't have really good information about that. Yeah, I, some of the people we talked to um, referenced a good working relationship with their health and how, how the activities that they're doing are coordinated with public health. Um, but I'm not aware of any actual public health entities that we spoke with directly. Yeah, this this is Dan. I, I don't, we didn't talk directly um, to any health folks on our trip. As, as Libby mentioned, we are focusing more on the transportation practitioners. Um, if I, if I could go back really quickly to the transit uh, question, um, I wanted to make a quick plug for a document that FHWA will be publishing um, soon called Achieving Connected Networks, Applying Design Flexibility and Reducing Conflicts. That's going to include a lot of design information on enhancing pedestrian and bicycle access to and from transit. Um, and it's going to include some of the information that we learned on our trip from the Netherlands on, on um, good ways to improve access, uh, pedestrian and bicycle access to transit. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that our Federal Transit Administration, FTA, is actually working on a, a document specifically on pedestrian and bicycle access to transit. Um, so they are also fully committed in um, 
working in this space and, and providing resources to their uh, partners and stakeholders on the topic as well. So it's something that um, we're really focused on at the federal government level. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, the Netherlands and Germany used to have a very auto-oriented transportation system up to the 1950s, 1960s. Was there a tipping point to transitioning trans the transportation system that the U.S. could replicate to speed up the Im implementation process? That's a big question. I think, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I kick that to you guys. But I, I will just mention that some of their ped bike infrastructure is much older than that. They've had uh, paths connecting uh, cities for, for, I think, since the 20s, I was told. Yeah, I, um, but um, I think there's a very it's a popular um, characterization of, of the history, and I'm no, I'm not a historian, of course, but I think I think there's always been a really strong culture of cycling, or well, not always, but much longer has been a strong culture of cycling in the um, Netherlands and in Denmark. Um, but the infrastructure was, as it described, was very auto focused. Um, it's also popularly cited that um, the the community just said that they were fed up with traffic deaths, and that be, it became a rallying cry for from the from the ground up to make changes in how the planner engineers and planners design facilities. Um, and I suspect that those two things came together to leverage and accelerate into what we see today. Um, so whether we can replicate that here, I mean, I think culture is always changing, and I think there is definitely a shift toward um, more people bicycling for transportation and and um, and also for recreation um, and the current trend is vision zero is um, being cited as a goal in more and more municipalities every day um, mm -hmm. and I think um, so I think I think those are both going in the right direction maybe not to the same strength and emphasis as it was um, in the ne Netherlands but um, still I think a promising sign yeah. But that's all just opinion. <laughs> yeah. So yes. we did we did get yeah, if you read the report there is a little bit of information about the national priorities and I think that did help kick start things in the Netherlands. Um so there was, as Connor mentioned, a real shift in the national safety focus and the sustainable safety, which is kind of their name for more uh similar vision zero type of um approach and, and they interacted with um, regional and local jurisdictions in ways to motivate them to make safety improvements and start addressing a lot of the design issues and, and connectivity issues. So I think there was uh, probably a bit uh, a convergence of all of those things that did maybe help push things along on top of the legacy of the basic street networks and things like that and, and side paths and things that were um, already present. Yeah, so this is Gabe. I, I just want to pile on to what uh, Connor and Libby are saying. But yeah, that was a, the, the history was something that, that Dan and I have talked at, at length with a number of Dutch about, including Dutch advocacy groups, just getting a sense what place they started from and and we got a, a a pretty consistent story from from a variety of people that we talked with saying that in, in the 70s um with energy crisis issues and also safety you know traffic deaths rising that that their you know, citizens made a um, a conscious decision to to voice their concerns about continuing down the path of an auto focused culture and so there are a number of of steps that 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 happened to, to sort of uh, sort of re return to their roots, so to speak, I guess, and in, in having a more non-motorized friendly uh, transportation system. So there are some events that, that triggered in the 70s, and then there are a few different epics that they have um, leading up through the, the 90s where, where they've made conscious decisions to, to steer away from that, uh, pardon the pun. Um, and you know, if you actually look back at our international scan report on walking and biking safety and mobility, you'll see similar themes that play out across the, the water in uh, Denmark and, and other uh, countries like Switzerland where they had um, you know, significant vehicle parking downtown and now vehicles prohibited from being in those. So I, I think a, a number of these countries, Germany included, as was mentioned in the question, 
there has been a progression. And I guess, you know, from the U.S. standpoint, I'd say that that just indicates that, you know, things like this can happen here, too, and are starting to in a number of cities across the country. All right, thank you. And I have um, uh, two more follow-up questions to the, the transit discussion. Uh, the first was, Dan, could you please repeat the name of your uh, the publication, the Access to Transit publication that will be coming out soon? <clears throat> FHWA has, has a, a report coming out called Achieving Connected Networks, Applying Design Flexibility, and Reducing Conflicts. It's going to include um, 24 standalone design topics or cut sheets um, focusing on different topics that, that really all contribute to um, the same general outcomes, which are achieving connected networks, improving safety, promoting equity. Um, and so that's a, to a, a publication that FHWA will be putting out um, probably in April um, or early May. Um, the Federal Transit Administration also has a, a separate guidebook for transit access. I don't have the exact name for that in front of me right now. Um, but I, if, if you have a specific question, you're welcome to email me, um, and I can put you in touch uh, with the project managers at FTA for that effort. All right, thank you. And then the follow-up and the, the, the other follow-up uh, to the transit question is, um, can you talk more about negotiating in-street conflicts such as uh, shared bus and bike lanes? Um, how do you loop bike transit to limit conflicts with buses or transit lanes? Are there any best practices from other countries in thinking about this in particular? Yeah, I didn't, um, we didn't come across a lot of great information about that to my knowledge. I don't know, Libby, do you have anything else to add? No, we didn't, and I think we did ask explicitly about transit and innovations, and again, uh, it may be the limitations of this study, which focused on, on just the recent past, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't really recall a lot relating to transit emerging. So the, this is Dan. So the two resources I just talked about are going to include a lot of that information. Um, mm -hmm. Not as much focused on information from other countries, but, but definitely information on best practices and lessons learned and, and design guidance um, will be highlighted heavily, uh, focusing specifically on transit. Um, I'd say that the, the sustainable safety approach, though, from the, from the Dutch is something that can certainly be applied in the context of transit. And so that all, you know, comes down to limiting the speed differential between the modes. Um, making sure that visibility is good for all the different users of the transportation system, um, slowing vehicles down specifically when they're turning, um, and really promoting active awareness, um, I think are all sort of general design principles that when you, when you think about a transit site, um, I think can really help to inform all the um, you know, site-specific design decisions that are being made. I think, I think generally also, oh, go ahead. Uh, last thing I was going to say is just generally reducing the speed of the motor vehicles also around transit stations is something that um, I think certainly is, is something that we should be thinking about in this country. All right, thank you, Dan. Um, I think we have time for two or three more questions. Um, next question I got is, did you find any performance standards for the maintenance of pedestrian and bicycle routes? such as winter snow removal or pavement uh, marking retro, retro reflectivity, for example? Yes, um, that was actually a, a strong emphasis at a, for a number of countries um, that, we, that we talked to. Um, uh, Toronto was one example. Um, they have a clear snow removal policy. Um, I think Helsinki, if I recall collect, correctly, um, those are obviously two cities in pretty wintry climates. Um, but pavement com pavement condition was something that kept coming up. Um, I mentioned a little bit about the um, Finland's um, even evenness evaluation. Um, the Danish, uh, if I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to rack my brain for all the what we looked at. But the Danish um, have pretty clear guidelines on on facility maintenance. But, um, 
it's it's one way that I think the countries in the global scan are pretty far advanced from where our, a lot of our best practices, and that's just I think a product of having been doing having been doing it on a broader scale for a longer time. Um, I don't know if Dan or Libby have anything else to add to that. Hi, this is Gabe. I, I just wanted to plug another Federal Highways resource that might be helpful to you. It, it's our guide for maintaining pedestrian facilities for enhanced safety, and it, it covers a number of maintenance issues, um, you know, as far as snow removal goes, but also uh, uh, pavement quality or, or you know, sidewalk quality. So you might want to look up that resource, and it's on our Federal Highway Administration safety website. It came out in October 2013. Thanks, Gabe. All right. Uh, next question I got is, what were some of the funding sources for the pedestrian and bicycle facilities in the countries you visited and studied, and how do they differ from the U.S.? So, Connor, do you want to take that? I can just say a bit about it, and, and then I'll kick it to you if you have any, anything to add. So we didn't really delve into the funding sources so much. We learned more, and I'll bet Gabe and Dan talked more to the Netherlands officials since they met with all levels. Um, and the main, the main takeaway that uh, we gathered from the death review is that uh, there is a lot of local discretion, the funding is kind of, uh, seems to be trickled out to the regions and then perhaps administered by the regions to the local jurisdictions. And it seems to be more or less up to them how to plan uh, the use of those resources. Is, is that about right, Dan and Gabe? Oh. Hey, Libby, yeah, this is Gabe. Yeah, Dan and I are mm -hmm. nodding our heads yes. I think that, that's mm -hmm. by and large the, what we've found too. Mm -hmm. The only thing I would add to that um, is that the funding sources are mostly the same. It's the amounts that are different, right? The um, the levels of funding are stronger. Um, mm -hmm. We did we did come across a couple examples of public-private partnerships, um, but I think we you also find those here. Um, it's not an overwhelming overwhelming difference. All right, and our last question for today is. In your opinion, which country has the most innovative bicycling infrastructure system, and what in particular was the most innovative cycling facility that you found? <laughs> I don't know if we, I, I can answer can, that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, we, we um, one of the outcomes of this project was to recommend a location for um, Dan and Gabe to travel to and we as a team endorsed the idea of um, having them visit the Netherlands and it's a little bit of the obvious answer um, but their their accomplishments in, in mode split with the um, with it, within the context they're in uh, are hard to ignore um, but Having said that, there are just there are lots of examples in, in the report. You, you know, people people should definitely take a look at the report. And I, um, there's really cool ideas all over the place. Uh, I mentioned the rain sensor one. I think that one's really neat. Um, just thinking about how we can use technology. The places that are thinking about how we can use technology to um, get you know reduce the barriers to walking and biking and get more people out um, moving around um, walking on, on foot and bike. Yeah. Yeah, this is Dan. I guess the only the thing I would add, I mean, we only visited the Netherlands, so it's hard to compare to the other countries. But I think, to me, one of the key innovations was just um, creating a essentially a fully separated network for biking that really appeals to the broad range of people, of, you know, all ages and abilities. I think that's that's sort of an uh, a part a main part of the story on the innovation in the Netherlands is just that they've got the 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 separated network um, where there's an assumption that if there's a lot of cars and they're traveling very fast, um, that sharing a lane is, is not good enough. And and kind of working from that assumption and creating a fully separated network, I think, is is one of the, the innovations. And, and that that's the separate facility, but then it also gets to things like protected intersections, which is something that we're certainly um, looking at um, from our perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to reiterate that same point, Dan. I think it, it's more about how they plan these um, these kind of trying to 
create these connected, low-stress networks that allow uh, long, un uninterrupted cycling trips. And um, one good example, if you read in the report, is from The Hague in the Netherlands, which uh, they refer to their network as star routes. So they're really planning these um, connected corridors. Uh, comfort they're intended to be comfortable, direct, fast, and secure. They try to bypass. Uh, conflict areas to the extent possible, but um, when they when they can't do that, then they're more likely to go to sort of the low stress, make connections on the um, like a bike street type of facility if they have to provide a shared facility to make some types of connections. But when they can, they uh, use overpasses over canals and arterials and things like that. And uh, when they can, if they have to take bikes through intersections, then again, they try to provide these, um, the plan is to provide more bicycle priority and, and time signals and so forth so that um, cycles can safely get through these junctions. And I, and I would th say that I expect the same is true of, um, of pedestrian facilities. Yeah, just to add on that, I mean, I. You know, I mentioned the the separated network, but 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 really, as you said, just the seamless efficiency of traveling by bike is is also just a a, a critical innovation or accomplishment that they've sort of implemented. That that um, it seems like we really have have some more work to do on that space to make it um, so efficient to get from point A to point B um, is something that I think we can really learn from. Yeah, exactly. Because they consider if one if there's one missing link, then it may uh, ruin the chances for that for that trip. So yeah, exactly. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for uh, question and answers today. I'm sorry we didn't get to your question. Once again, presentation slides and a video recording of the webinar will be posted to pedbikeinfo.org/webinars uh, sometime next week. Um, be sure to follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash pedbike for updates. Finally, I want to let you know that there will be a very brief survey that pops up once the webinar is entered. We'd love for you to uh, let us know how we did today. And thank you again to all our speakers, uh, Hannah, Libby, Connor, Dan, and Gabe. And thank you to all of you for attending today's TBIC webinar.